All right, welcome everybody. This is the uh, NFCB Music Licensing Hangout. My name is Ken Friedman. I am Station Manager and Program Director of WFMU. And uh, I apologize for the bad lighting. And uh, we're going to be talking for about an hour here about music licensing. I put up a, an agenda earlier. Um, but uh, the main thing that I want to achieve today um, is to try, try to reduce the amount of confusion and fear that's out there in the community radio world concerning music licensing. And I say reduce the amount of fear because I know it's going to be impossible to eliminate it altogether. Uh, music licensing is a real complicated mess. It was not a process. It was not a system that was um, thought out and then um, and then put forth by any of the agencies involved. It's uh, a process that has been developing for many, many decades, and it's resulted in a huge mess. And what happened, the background of this hangout um, is that um, Sally Kane of NFCB asked me to present on this topic at the uh, NFCB regional in Olympia. So I tried to quickly come up to speed on the topic. At my, at my talk on this topic in Olympia, I made a couple of errors, and people corrected my mistakes. Uh, and then in the weeks afterwards, I learned a lot more. So I'm almost up to speed. I am certainly not 100% up to speed. I don't think anybody could be in, in this area. There's so many nooks and, cran and crannies. But I'm as up to speed as I'm going to be uh, for a while. Uh, this stuff changes really, really fast. So we're going to be talking about webcasting, um, archiving, podcasting, um, the legality of broadcasting, uh, digital files such as the kind that you find on iTunes. Spotify, YouTube, etc. Uh, some alternative copyright strategies, uh, getting local releases, and then we'll try to um, dispel some myths if we can. And uh, by the way, if anybody ever, if anybody has questions, um, if anybody has questions uh, that they would like to get in, just uh, put them into the uh, Q and A column, which is on the right. Uh, you can activate it by. Uh, on the left hand side, clicking the icon that says Q&A and uh, note to Liz, um, I think it would be easier for me after all, if you um, compiled questions or just put them into the Q&A section. I have too many different things to, uh, to try to pay attention to. OK, so let's start off talking about performing rights organizations, also known as PROs. Different performing rights organizations that we're going to be talking about today are ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, those are those are three that represent um, composers, authors, and 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 uh, performers. Um, Sound Exchange is another one that is going to come up. The Harry Fox Agency, and then once we get outside of the United States, there's a whole slew of others: uh, GEMA, PRS, Sound Reef, which we won't talk about. Uh, the main four that broadcasters have to deal with are ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and Sound Exchange. Um, the uh, different types of musical rights that we're going to talk about today, I'll get to those in a second, but one thing that I think probably a lot of people don't realize is that every piece of music carries with it, oh, perhaps um, five different types of copyrights. Um, there's all different kinds of copyrights depending on um, the kind of use of the music that you're talking about. Uh, one is the master license, which is also known as the phono right. Uh, the performance license, which is the kind of license that comes into play for webcasting and broadcasting. A synchronization license, also known as a sync license. This comes into play when uh, you're getting li a license to put music to video or film. Uh, the mechanical license, which comes into play when you're making a recording uh, available for sale, either through a record or tape or a digital file. A print license, which pertains to the sheet music or the lyrics um, to the piece of music. And then there are blanket, what are called sometimes blanket or statutory licenses. So that's a bit of background. Um, throw into this awful mix in, uh, we will, is something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is a United States federal law uh, that was put into effect in 1996. Um, and in my opinion, what happened in 1996 is the music industry lobbyists beat everybody else to Washington uh, and got a very, very complicated set of rules put into federal law that didn't really take into account 
um, broadcasting traditions or the interests of broadcasters at all. Uh, and this, this rule, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, also known as the DMCA, contains what are called complementary rules, uh, which dictate um, some of the rules regarding webcasting. Now, regarding webcasting, um, let's start off with the easiest issue of all, which is that if you are a CPB qualified station, uh, meaning you're getting a, a community service grant, a CSP grant uh, from, uh, from the CPB, you are covered completely uh, for webcasting uh, in terms of paying the annual fees. Uh, and you are also covered completely in terms of um, ASCAP, BM, ASCAP uh, and BMI, I believe, not CSAC, but ASCAP and BMI. Uh, that's something that CPB covers all CST grantees for. If you are an NFCB participating station um, without a CSG grant, uh, then you are still covered for the webcasting fees, uh, but you are not covered for ASCAP BMI. This is a point that I got wrong when I spoke on this issue in Olympia. Uh, NFCB participating stations are covered for sound exchange in terms of the annual fee. Uh, they are not covered for ASCAP and BMI. Uh, they have to arrange their own ASCAP and BMI um, royalty, royalty fees and, and agreements separately. Um, if you are not an, an NFCB participating station, you're a college or community station, uh, you have to pay $500 a year uh, to sound exchange for the right to webcast your music. Uh, the fees that you have to pay for um, ASCAP and BMI and CSAC um, are usually less than $500 a year, about $288. Uh, and if you are not if you are not covered for broadcasting and webcasting on ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, you will have to get separate broadcasting and webcasting licenses for ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. My guess is that most of the people um, watching or listening today um, are covered. Um, Either through NFCB as participating stations, or the uh, or or through uh, Corporation of Public Broadcasting (CSP). Um, so we know that so all those stations are covered in terms of uh, the royalty payments and the overall agreements uh, between Sound Exchange and those stations. And those rules have just recently been extended uh, for another five years. So the rules that are in place now are in place until the end of 2020. Um, by the way, Spinatron. Um, and NFCB both have some really good information um, about all this stuff on their websites. I'm just trying to break it down and make it as digestible as possible. So I'm actually really eliminating a lot of the fine details to try to make, uh, make the major points. So if you are covered, if your station is covered for broadcasting um, over the web via sound exchange, you still have to take care of your annual reporting. And most stations are probably only going to have to report four times a year for a period of two weeks each time. And for that period of two weeks each time, you have to you have to uh, submit to, to submit to NPR Digital Services uh, the following information: the song title, the artist title, the album title if there is one, and the record label if there is one. Those are the four pieces of information that NPR Digital Services will compile on behalf of all the stations reporting uh, and then submit that to Sound Exchange. You can report separately to Sound Exchange if you want, but it's not worth the trouble. Um, now, NPR Digital Services has a deal with NFCB where um, NFCB stations have to pay $270 a year to NPR Digital Services to reimburse them for the cost of uh, compiling all this data. In one of the many great ironies in the area of music licensing, if you pay $100 <laughs> to Sound Exchange, then you opt out altogether from the need. So it's actually less expensive, $100 per year, to just say, no thanks, I'm not going to report. Um, it's less expensive to do that than it is to pay the $270 a year that NFCB will pass on to uh, NPR Digital Services. That said, I still think it's a really good idea to try to come up with the $270 per year and to actually um, do the reporting because it not only helps the artists, artists actually, believe it or not, do get some money from Sound Exchange from all the money that goes into this fairly large pool of money. 
And the majority of that pool of money comes from Sirius XM satellite radio, as well as Pandora. Uh, but if your station is playing these artists and they are registered with sound exchange, they will get the money. So it's a good idea for the artist. You're helping out, you're helping out the artists by registering and, uh, or rather by submitting this information four times a year. But it's also really good for audience building. I think it's a really good idea. This, my, my experience is that people want, uh, the, the information about what the name of the music that's being played at the current moment, that they want that just about more than anything else, especially on a music program. Um, so you're killing two birds with one stone by getting this information out there. And if you need, if you need, um, off the shelf tools for taking care of your playlist and helping you with these reporting requirements, the two best existing tools out there uh, are NPR Digital Services Tool Composer um, or Spinatron.com. Those are the two best off-the-shelf services right now that will allow your music shows to playlist um, and to uh, and to submit the reports to uh, NPR Digital Services, who then pass them on to Sound Exchange. So the reports that you need to compile four times a year. Um, are really two. There's two reports that you have to do for each one of these 14-day periods. We're talking about four 14-day periods, one located in each quarter for the year. And during each one of those sound exchange reporting periods, uh, you have to give them a record of every song that was played, the four points of information that I mentioned, song title, artist title, album title, record label um, title, if, if appropriate, um, as well as what time every song started, what what time every song ended. Uh, this is where Spinatron and um, NPR Digital's composer could come in really handy. Um, and then you're, you're also going to need, need to submit a log file um, from your streaming service uh, because to uh, go along with that, to go along with the text report that you need to give them, you need to show them how many people were listening at the start time of every song, how many people were listening at the end time of every song, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have the ability to compile this information, um, it's a really good idea. It helps the artists. I think it, it provides a really critical service to your listeners. Uh, and then you pay $270 through NFCB uh, to di NPR Digital Services for taking care of that. If you can't deal with this at all, and I know there's a lot of stations uh, who can't deal with this at all, then you, all you have to do is pay $100, uh, to, I think, directly to Sound Exchange. Um, and then you're off the hook for the reporting. Um, feel free to weigh in anybody who has any questions or comments uh, in the in the Q and A column on the right. If you're not seeing the Q and A column on the right, um, then you can activate it uh, by uh, hitting the Q and A button on the left. Oh, Sally points out that the the uh, fee is $275 per year. It's not $270. Uh, so the NFCB. Um, the NFCB fee that gets paid to NPR Digital Services for their help in preparing uh, the uh, the reports is $275 a year, and NFCB does NFCB will send out a bill to every NFCB station for that. Okay, I'm looking at my notes here now, and it turns out that the uh, the CPB agreement. I've already made at least one mistake, probably more. Uh, feel free to correct me. In the question and answer session, in the question and answer column, uh, the CPB agreement that um, covers all CSG receiving stations covers ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. It covers all three: ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Um, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, by the way, are the three performing rights organizations that deal, for the most part, um, with the song or the composition, uh, whereas uh, Sound Exchange is dealing with the master license, or also known as the phono right, um, and that's controlled by the uh, usually the record label. Okay, any questions on anything that we've covered up until now? Because next we're going to move on to uh, archiving and podcasting. How's my terrible light doing? Oh yeah, good. It's just as bad as it's been the entire time. All right. Okay, going along um, with these agreements for um, sound exchange. Um, sound exchange also does allow um, for radio stations to make their programming available as a streaming on-demand archive for a period of two weeks. 
So you are allowed to make all of your programming available for streaming for a two week period. It's perfectly legal, um, no extra expense whatsoever. That's for a streaming on demand archive, meaning that you're not allowed to offer it as a download because as soon as you offer a download, that brings up another one of the types of licenses that we talked about, which is the, uh, the mechanical license, because you're talking about a perfect digital copy uh, as, soon as, you're, as soon as you're talking about a download. And that's the problem with podcasting. Podcasting um, is actually the act of downloading a perfect digital copy. So there is no license for podcasting. There is no license for podcasting copyrighted music, that is. Um, that said, nobody has gotten in trouble yet for, uh, for making copyrighted music available via podcasting. I don't suggest that that's something that stations get into in any way whatsoever. Um, it's a weird gray area, but if you want to be able to legally podcast a program, it either has to have no copyrighted music or it has to have music that's available under alternative copyrights, such as Creative Commons licenses. Uh, and you can find tons of Creative Commons music out there on a wide variety of sites, archive.org, uh, CC Mixter, Gemendo, uh, WFMU's own free music archive. Uh, and you can also record your own music. Bear in mind that you have the right as a radio station to record your own music uh, and to license it under certain terms with the artists who are recording it. Um, you could either pay the artist or they might be willing to donate their work. And you then have the right to include that music, music that's actually locally produced and locally recorded by your own station. You can include that in your podcast. Uh, at WFMU, we have a variety of podcasts, some of which we actually go to the trouble of editing most of the copyrighted music out of. When I say most of the copyrighted music out, what I mean is that we might leave the first 10 seconds of a song in and the last 10 seconds of a song in just so it's a little bit more understandable um, continuity wise continuity wise of what's going on. Um, I want to back up a bit because uh, there are some complementary rules about the uh, about webcasting that I forgot to mention. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act from 1996, uh, which bear in mind is a 19 year old law at this point, a 19 year old federal law, has some prohibitions in it against uh, what, what are called the complementary rules, uh, web, the complementary webcasting rules, which say things like you're not allowed to play uh, more than a certain number of tracks within an hour from a certain box set. You're not allowed to play more than a certain number of songs by the same artist. Uh, there's a, it says that it's illegal to pre-publish, uh, I think what's called the pre-publication announcement. So you're not allowed to say, and now here's a song by Radiohead and then play a song by Radiohead. Uh, that's actually illegal according to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act complementary rules. So there's a lot of these rules out there that have um, struck a lot of fear in um, all sorts of broadcasters, but especially community radio. And I just wanted to try to um, reassure people that none of those complementary rules have ever actually been enforced since 1996. Uh, the only rule that I know that ever even came close to being enforced was when David Byrne did an hour of Missy Elliott music music on a uh, on a web radio show that he was doing, and all that happened was Sound Exchange wrote him a letter and said, "Please don't do that anymore." And he said, "I'm sorry," and that was the end of that. Um, so I think a lot of these complementary rules um, are very very low risk. It, it, this is really a question for your general manager and for your local board of directors to determine how much risk they're willing to take on, but my feeling is that ignoring those Digital Millennium Copyright Act rules um, is a fairly low risk thing to do at this point. Um, okay, I'm gonna, some questions are popping up now on the list. How does this work? Select the question. Larry Stein asks, what if locally recorded music is performing a cover of somebody else's song regarding podcasting? And it's a great question. Um, yeah, you're talking about two different rights there. A locally recorded musician um, will own the master or somebody else may own the master recording. But if it's somebody else's song, um, you're not covered because you, you still have to deal with the, uh, the laws covering that composition. 
So um, yeah, but if you want to if you want to create music for your news or public affairs programs um, that can be legally used as bumpers or headers or intros or outros um, to a news or public affairs show, it has to be an original composition uh, because if it's a cover tune, you're not addressing the, the underlying composition. Okay, let's see the next question here. Um, AJ asks, uh, sound exchange reporting waiver only applies when listener hours are below a certain, a certain number, um, as I understand. Yes, that is correct. And um, let me try to get you the answer to that. I have that, I have the information. Okay, I had the information here. Oh, geez, please. Okay, hang on. Um, yeah, the uh, sound exchange reporting requirements um, vary depending on whether you are in the uh, lowest 70% of aggregate tuning hours. Aggregate tuning hours is just a method of calculating um, webcast listenership. Uh, one person listening for three hours is three aggregate tuning hours. Three people listening for three hours is nine aggregate tuning hours. So if you're in the lowest 70% of music aggregate tuning hours, um, then you only have to report for these four 14 day periods per year. If, however, you're in the top 30% of aggregate tuning hours, um, and this goes for the entire um, CPB system, if you're in the top 30%, you actually are supposed to report everything 24 hours a day. Uh, to NPR Digital and then have it passed on to Sound Exchange. All right, done with that question. Um, okay, I think this is from Sally, who's pointing out that um, that NFCB. Let's select it. I'm not sure if you can see the questions when I select them, but um, Sally is pointing out that um, NFCB and Native Public Media. Um, have asked Garvey, Schubert, and Bearer, um, the great lawyers, Melody Virtue and John Krigler, to write a chapter on music rights, DMCA, and digital space in general with regard to legal issues. That's great. I love John Krigler and Mel Melody Virtue. Uh, the only problem that I see with getting all your information from lawyers is that they are, by definition, lawyers, and they can really only tell you um, the letter of the law and I think in this area it's actually really important to uh, pay more attention to what's being enforced what's not being enforced and and at the level of the board of directors and the level of the general manager decide what level of risk is appropriate for your station because there are certainly certain levels of risk uh, that I think are perfectly okay um, and then other levels levels of risk that are not okay um, let's see I'm going to select another question here. Services which did not exceed, I think I, okay, I don't understand that. Um, bear with me while I try to clear out the question and answer column here. I haven't done a Google Hangout in about three months and um, it's really gotten um, incredibly, incredibly um, overly complicated. Our own Liz Berg put a helpful um, link up there. Um, I'm not sure if everybody can see it or not, um, but there's a, uh, can you all see the links? The, the question that I'm working on at the time, does that show up at the top? I'm not sure if it does or not. Uh, we have other ways that we can share links as well. Um, all right. So we covered archiving and podcasting and alternative copyrights. Um, and uh, getting local releases. And that brings up um, another um, good topic, which is the idea that when people, um, when people are, um, when stations are trying to get rights to locally produced music by local musicians, um, for example, um, your station needs to come up with some release forms. Um, it's nowhere near as simple as it used to be in the old days when we were simply broadcasting over the FM. Uh, and if a band came to perform in your studios, it was kind of tacitly understood that they are there to perform on the air. So you don't necessarily have to ask them 
for written permission to perform on the air. Otherwise, why would they be there? Um, back in those days, we never asked for rights. Now we have not only now not only do we give just about every band that passes through WFMU um, a release form, but we actually have many different variations of release forms. Uh, because now you need to not only get a right to broadcast their work over the air, you probably should also get in writing that they're okay with the idea that it's going to be archived for two weeks, um, or if you're planning on archiving it for longer than that, which you do have the right to do if it's locally produced original music, um, you want to get that in writing as well. Um, if you're videotaping any of the music, you probably want to get the permission um, to videotape them. And what we do at WFMU is we offer to give the entire videotape as well as the entire audio tape to the band. Uh, and what we ask for is attribution so that if they ever do press it on a commercial release, at least the radio station and the engineer and the DJ who hosted them will all get written credit uh, in the liner notes. That's what we hope for. Uh, when we videotape a band, we try to get permission um, to use up to at least 10 minutes of the video for our own internal non-commercial promotional uh, purposes. Um, so these are some of the issues surrounding um, local releases, getting releases to the music. And I don't know of a good online source that has uh, various licenses and release forms, but we have a whole bunch internally here at WFMU, which I'm always happy to share. Um, you can email me at ken at WFMU.org. Let's see, we're about halfway through here. Um, yes, you can see it. That's great. Thank you, Christy. All right, so if anybody has um, links that they want to share, uh, you can also put them up in the, uh, in the Q&A section. All right, now let's see. Um, I'm just getting a text message from Ruth. Yes, OK, cool. I wanted to um, dispel some myths. There's myths um, all over the place here. Oh, first, Christy has a question. Uh, Christy asks, what about being able to compi compile local recordings for a premium? Ex do, do you need explicit permission? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up um, because, yeah, I think, I think one of the releases that we use at WFMU for like just the normal broadcast and webcast I believe also gives us permission to use one track uh, on a promotional various artist compilation. Um, sometimes you have to go back again, um, but yeah, you do you do have to get explicit permission uh, to put to put um, a song uh, on a uh, for for example a, a marathon premium various artist compilation. But bear in mind once again that it would have to only be an original composition. That if you were going to if you were going to um, put together a marathon a, a pledge drive premium that consisted of cover versions, then you still have to pay the publishing rights or perhaps even the mechanical rights on those cover versions, uh, which actually can sometimes be affordable. I can tell you a story about one of our most popular DJs we ever had here was a guy named Tom Sharpling, who did a show called The Best Show on WFMU. Um, and he's since uh, uh, amicably parted ways with WFMU, and he's now doing a podcast on his own. Uh, but one of the most popular pledge drive premiums we ever had was when he decided to do a various artist compilation that would be um, a cover album of Paul McCartney's album Ram. So he got different artists to each cover a different song from the from the Paul McCartney Ram album, and it turned out that. Uh, the Harry Fox agency controlled all the publishing rights to the Paul McCartney catalog, not to the Beatles catalog, but just to the Paul McCartney catalog. So we were able to get a very reasonable rate from the Harry Fox agency. The Harry Fox agency is who you need to pay whenever you're putting something up potentially for sale or whenever you're making multiple digital copies of something. Uh, and the Harry Fox agency will charge you based on how many copies you're planning on making, et cetera, et cetera. But it came out to be very inexpensive and uh, very affordable. I think it came out to be about approximately a dollar fifty per CD uh, to deal with the legal uh, permissions, just allowing these artists to do a cover of a Paul McCartney tune. So that's just an example of uh, you know how it how it can work um, with the Harry Fox agency. All right, let's talk about some other myths that I was hoping to dispel here. Um, a, a common question. 
well, let's say myths and uh, myths and oddities and unanswerable questions. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on the NFCB list. Um, I'm sorry, I just lost my hangout. There we go. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on NFCB listservs lately about whether or not it is legal to air songs from Spotify, from iTunes, from YouTube on the air. Uh, the, quick, the quick answer is no, it's not legal to do that. Uh, the more nuanced answer is that I think it's very low risk for you to do that. I've never, ever heard of anybody getting in trouble for airing YouTube, iTunes, Spotify on the air. But again, that's a, that's a, that's a risk analysis that has to take place not at the individual programmer level, but really at the level of the board of directors and the general manager. Um, that said, if you're going to do that, you should probably make sure that you're paying for the premium service for Spotify so that you don't risk the, even the slightest possibility of ever accidentally airing a commercial. Because a service like Spotify, if you pay five or ten dollars a month, then it eliminates all the commercials from ever um, being included in their music service. So you want to make sure that you're not going to accidentally air a commercial from these services. You also want to make sure that um, you're not airing really low quality fidelity files. Like a lot of stuff on YouTube sounds truly awful. Um, if it's the best quality that you can find um, of something, well then I guess, you know, maybe you might want to air it anyway, but the, the, the audio quality of YouTube is the pits. Uh, iTunes is better. Spotify is better still. Um, so those, all those issues are technically illegal. Um, they're against the terms of service for any of those companies, um, but I think that as long as you're not like going on the air and saying, we just heard an hour of Missy Elliott played from Spotify, I think you're going to be okay. I don't think you're going to get in too much trouble for that. Uh, like I said, I, it, it's, a similar, it's a similar issue to a DJ bringing in bootleg albums. Um, I don't know that I don't know of a radio station that's ever gotten in trouble for playing bootleg albums. Maybe it's happened. I've just never heard of it. But again, I think if you air it and you just don't make a big deal about the fact that we just heard a 100 percent illegal bootleg recording of Bob Dylan at the Isle of Wight or whatever, as long as you're not calling that type of self-incriminating attention to it, I really don't think you're going to have a problem. Um, Kevin, I think, is saying that. Um, the Harry Fox agency charges 9.1 cents per song. Um, I guess, okay, I guess that, that's what Kevin is saying. I, I thought it um, also had something to do with how many copies. I think when you get a license from the Harry Fox agency uh, for making a uh, copy of something, I think it, they also uh, are wondering how many copies you're going to make, and you have to give them your best estimate on how many copies you're going to make. Um, Another common myth concerning music licensing is what I can describe as the less than 30 second rule. I've heard this described in a zillion different ways, and it is a complete and total myth. Uh, there is no length of time below which it's legal to use copyrighted material. Uh, I've, I've heard this as 30 seconds, 15 seconds, 7 seconds. There's no length of time at all. If you are using even half a second of copyrighted material without permission, you are subject to copyright violation. So there's no such thing as this length of time below which it's okay and over which it's not okay. The only thing even close to that is one very obscure rule concerning sound exchange reporting. And I don't think this is where the myth came from, but this is something that we found out by mistake. Funny story. Too. Maybe I can tell the story. Um, if you're a uh, if you're in the middle of your sound exchange reporting period, the kind of thing you have to do four times a year, and you have news and information programs or talk shows on the air, if those programs are using copyrighted music for less than 30 seconds, they don't have to report it. But only if it's a news show or a public affairs show, and it and it's just using like 29 seconds of uh, of a theme song. Now it's all, all that all that sound exchange is saying in that case is you don't have to report it. That's all. You still have to be covered for sound exchange. You just don't have to include that 29 second track because it was at the beginning of a news show. So I thought this was an interesting rule a couple of years ago. I told my staff about it uh, because people always 
people always complain about the fact that they have to report during these reporting periods because uh, some people don't like some of my DJs don't like putting in all four points of information. A lot of people are okay putting in the song title and the artist name, but they hate putting in the album title and the record label. So one of my bad boy DJs, Kenny G, um, heard about this below 29 second rule. So he did an entire three hour show in which no song was longer than 29 seconds. Uh, but they weren't really songs. And then he started bragging on Twitter about how he was doing this. And um, Sound Exchange saw <laughs> they, they, Sound Exchange saw his tweet. And then they took the issue up with me and they did not, they didn't find us. They didn't sue us, but they let me know that that 29 second rule deals only with news and information shows. You're not allowed to do a music show uh, with only songs, 29 seconds or less, and then not report those songs. Okay. Um, David uh, weighs in saying that the myth of the below 30 second rule uh, perhaps comes from the concept of fair use, which is a written word publishing concept. So that that's a good segue into fair use because fair use um, is a legal defense um, concerning all sorts of copyright and not just music copyrights, but um, all sorts of um, other copyrights. And bear in mind that fair use is not a very clearly delineated rule. And in really what fair use is, it's a legal defense. So if you're going to talk about fair use, then there's no point talking about fair use or trying to address a strategy that takes into account fair use because fair use is a legal defense. So you have to be if you're going to if you're going to start talking about fair use, then at least be prepared to perhaps heading towards a trial, in which case you're going to have to defend what you did under the ideas of fair use. And there's, I think, about four different criteria. Uh, that are guidelines for a judge to decide whether something was fair use or not, but there's no strict guidelines. It's, it's, it's very, very blurry. One of the most important guidelines concerning what constitutes fair use and what does not constitute fair use is was the work transformational? Um, so if you can argue that the work that you uh, included, the copyrighted material, that whether it was a photograph or a song, that you transformed it, it just wasn't it wasn't it couldn't possibly be mistaken for the original thing because you in terms of photography perhaps you put a filter over it in terms of music you layered sound effects and you put echo on it and all that that's a, re a reasonable argument that you have transformed it um, and that's part of the uh, that's one of the main guidelines for fair use but again fair use is not a black and white concept it's a legal defense which means that your luck in getting being successful in a in a fair use argument is going to vary judge to judge to judge so take that for what it's worth um okay larry asks what about copyrighted music as a theme for a show news and info or not um, used at the head and tail of every show less than 30 seconds um you're allowed to do that you're allowed to use copyrighted music as the theme for a show as long as you're paying all of your fees to all the PROs, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and Sound Exchange. If it's a news and information show and you're using less than 30 seconds of copyrighted music at the start and end of the show, you don't have to report it during Sound Exchange, but that's the only way you're off the hook. Uh, you would still you would still need to be covered in terms of the PROs for your right to use it in the first place. That's why this under 30 second concept is very confusing. And uh, pretty much any anytime I ever hear anybody talk about this, that, or the other thing being legal, as long as you use less than 30 seconds or less than 10 seconds, um, it's, it's, uh, it's usually inaccurate what I hear about that. Um, another common music licensing and copyright myth is that artists own their own material. Especially when artists get to a certain level of success, they usually don't own all of their own rights. Um, the record company usually owns the phono right, which is the, the master recording license. Um, and not only that, but artists can give up ownership of their compositions um, and they can give up right, the, the rights that they have to the master recordings. And then the people who own those rights can sell them and sell them and sell them again. 
So by simply asking an artist to sign off on something, the artist may not even be the person who controls the rights. And the artist may think they own the rights when they don't. Um, Paul is asking uh, another question here. Uh, when I said iTunes, did I mean Apple Music streaming or iTunes downloads? Um, purchase downloads, as far as I know, are just as legal as CDs. Um, also, Harry Fox Agency is 9.1 cents per song. Um, okay, and, and undercurrents. And uh, Liz, could you get the questions from Undercurrents and Max Jacobs on the main Hangout page? I'm not, I'm not seeing it there. Um, I am not sure, Paul. To the actual, the answer to that question: a purchase download uh, being just as legal as a CD. That's a really good question. You may be right. It might be. It might be perfectly legal um, to play a downloaded song um, on the air, but I'm not sure. Um, but like I said before, I think it's a very, very low risk um, if you're gonna if you're gonna be streaming music or broadcasting music from iTunes whether you've uh, streamed it or downloaded it. Um, I think as long as you're not making a really, really big deal of it, it's just an incredibly low risk. Uh, but there is, so, there is some risk. There's some risk. You could be the first case ever of somebody getting in trouble for that. Um, so just be aware, you know, whether, whether you are, um, whether you are bearing the amount of risk that you're comfortable with or not. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. I'm told that there were some questions on the main Hangout page. Maybe there's questions on the, U, on the YouTube page. I've asked Liz if she can go get those. Um, so feel free to uh, throw in any questions or comments you have over there. Uh, the last item that I have here, um, just as an oddity, um, is the sound-alike phenomenon, um, which is that you sometimes have uh, musicians you, you sometimes have musicians um, re-recording other people's songs with the intention of sounding as much like the original as possible. Uh, this is to get around the uh, master recording, because wh whichever record label recorded uh, some hit song um, owns that master. And in some cases, um, some artists have actually re-recorded uh, their, their own catalog in order to get the ownership rights back to their to their catalog. Suzanne Vega is a really good example of this. Um, Suzanne Vega um, re-recorded most of her big hits, like Tom Steiner, because she did not own the master recording. So she there were there was a lot of uh, a lot of rights music, a lot a lot of sampling rights that she wasn't getting a penny from. So she recorded her entire catalog over again so that she owned the master recordings she already probably she may have already owned the composition but by re-recording her own catalog and trying to make it as sound as much like the original as possible she was able to get around the idea of this record label owning her music for perpetuity i think prince did the same thing janice ian may have done the same thing also okay a question from undercurrents radio podcasting music it's okay to include examples of music being discussed in a record or concert review, right? Um, that's an area where you probably could make a really good fair use argument. Um, it's not necessarily okay. It's not a given. It's not a slam dunk that that's legal, but I would say that there's very, very low risk to doing that. If you're doing a an arts show or an arts or culture show uh, where you're discussing a local production, a local concert or theatrical production, and in the course of discussing that, you play a little bit of music uh, from that production. That is a very, very strong case for being transformational, um, for being news oriented, um, information oriented, um, that you're not just trying to give people a perfect digital copy of the song or the movie or the theatrical production in, in question. But it is a fair use. Um, it is probably a fair use argument. So again, it's, 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 it's a judgment call, but it, I, I, it's very hard to imagine anybody getting in trouble for that. Um, question from uh, Tom, Tom at Spinatron. Um, many of our, many of the Spinatron stations have found it easier to report to Sound Exchange than to NPR because of NPR's requirement for exact timestamp and duration on each song played. Sound Exchange doesn't even care about timestamps. Several stations have opted out of NPR digital um, for this. Yeah, that gets back to the thing I was mentioning before is that ironically, it's 
less expensive to opt out than to opt in in terms of um, NFCB stations. Um, and then if you if you are going to report um, and you're going to be reporting through NPR Digital, they are requiring not only the four pieces of information that we talked about earlier, but also um, the exact timestamps and duration for each song played. So if you can't do that, you have the option of of um, of uh, opting out by paying $100 to Sound Exchange, or perhaps by uh, reporting to Sound Exchange directly, as opposed to NPR Digital. Um, another question here from Graham Rice. Um, okay, we talked about that. We've already addressed Graham's question, which came in earlier. Um, Bainbridge Community Radio asks, when assessing the risk of enforcement in the case of a podcast that un unlawfully uses copyrighted music, isn't there the risk that the podcast listing could be kicked off the iTunes podcast store by Apple? Yes, that could happen. Uh, I'm not sure what the history of, of that. There's an awful lot of podcasts out there that contain nothing but copyrighted material. Uh, I'm not sure if they get kicked off of uh, the iTunes store automatically or not. Um, Automatic content ID is another really interesting area that we haven't even talked about yet, unless you were tuned in early. <laughs> because moments before this um, Google Hangout started, I started playing uh, some theme music, and then I quickly realized what a stupid thing that was to do. Because YouTube, for example, does content ID, uh, where if you put up a video and the, and the video contains copyrighted music, uh, YouTube may take it down and they may actually give you a strike. They may they may restrict your ability to upload things for a while. They kind of they may put you on probation, and they may do that even if it's a cover version. Um, so I know that services like SoundCloud uh, and YouTube um, use a massive amount of content, automatic content ID like that. So you have to be very careful not to put up anything copyrighted, like on a station YouTube account. You want to make sure that there's nothing nothing on there that's copyrighted that you don't have the rights to um, just because it could screw up your YouTube account and it could end up uh, restricting even if, even if even if YouTube grants you back the ability to get into your account they may restrict you from the types of things you can upload for example one of the punishments that YouTube doles out for content ID infractions is to tell you that you can't upload anything longer than five minutes for another three months that's that's a typical YouTube punishment for content ID infraction. Uh, Sally from NFCB says that purchase downloads from the iTunes store are perfectly legal. Um, that's good to know. Um, Max Jacobs says there are some podcasts like NPR's All Songs Considered that rely exclusively on copyrighted material. Do you have any idea what their justification for use of that music is? Um, fair use because it's journalism, perhaps? Um, I doubt that. I, I doubt that they're calling it journalism. Most of the single song podcasts, such as All Songs Considered from NPR or KEXP Song of the Day uh, or the Free Music Archive Song of the Day, I'm positive that in terms of KEXP and the Free Music Archive, those are in-studio performances that have been edited down to a single song uh, where the artist actually uh, gave permission. Um, the, the, where the composer gave and the band gave permission for that song to be included on a podcast. I don't know what uh, the arrangement is like for NPR's All Songs Considered, except I would strongly guess that they are getting the rights to do that one way or another. But that's a little bit, that's a kind of a unique case because NPR's, NPR and All, All Songs Considered in general has so much carriage, it has such a huge audience that a lot of artists would love for one song to be available on that for a certain period of time, uh, whereas um, a small community station may not be in the position to get that so same kind of right. Um, but um, other single song podcasts are legal because the single songs are made available via a, a station release for podcasting or for other purposes. Uh, I think I'm not positive, but I believe in KEXP's um, song of the day podcast, uh, the right that they have to podcast that expires after a certain period of time. It is not a perpetual right, um, which is another option you have because a lot of artists are not comfortable granting various rights in perpetuity. So a lot of rights that are granted are granted um, with a 
either a, a unilateral right to exit the agreement um, or an expiration date that we have the right to archive your performance on our radio station, uh, but only for another month, at which point we have to take it down. Um, okay, Kevin says I'm correct. All songs considered licenses directly with rights holders, which is actually probably even um, more complicated than it normally would be because uh, if they're, if all songs considered is uh, putting out a podcast of original songs that have come out on a record label, they not only have to get permission from the publisher, whoever controls the, uh, the composition and the song credits, they also have to get the permission from the master license holder, usually the record label that owns the master recording, and they might even need to get permission from the Harry Fox agency. Um, so yeah, in a, in a simple case like that, you still have, might need to get rights from three different organizations. It's not that complicated if it's an in-studio, if it's a band that actually recorded a song on your airwaves. Um, and uh, Ruth, oh, I miss it. OK, David says, uh, another Creative Commons music source is magnitude.com. Um, the other ones I mentioned earlier were gemendo.com, freemusicarchive.org, which comes from WFMU, uh, CC Mixter. There's many, many, many. Um, all right, we only have another five minutes or so, so please get any final questions you have here. Uh, one other thing that doesn't really fall into the area of myths, but um, an interesting um, area nonetheless is public domain music. Um, I guess the myth surrounding public domain music is that you can't always be sure that something that's supposed to be public domain is public domain. I'm not even going to get into the rules about what qualifies something as public domain, but there's a lot of gray area <laughs> in what's described as public domain. There might be situations where the composition is in public domain, but the master recording is not. Plus, if you're going to claim that something's in public domain, you are supposed to actually have proof uh, that the music is in the public domain. There's a lot of stuff out there that's called public domain that is not really public domain. Uh, and there's also some music out there uh, that's been put under Creative Commons licenses that contains copyrighted music that's not cleared. So you can't always go by uh, what an uploader claimed that something is by pub something is available on public domain. Um, and various, it, it, it's like saying that something is public domain should be taken with a huge grain of salt, and you should really try to verify that for. For this reason or that reason, this piece of music really is public domain. If something truly is public domain, you can do anything with it. You can actually sell it. You can actually put it on a record and sell it. Um, public domain is also, and a lot of these rules, almost all the rules that I'm talking about are very country to country. Public domain especially varies uh, huge, huge differences between what's public domain in, in Europe and the UK and the United States. Um, all right, I'm just going to answer the couple of remaining questions. This is from uh, KPFT. Um, how about for programmers who decide to podcast their programs on their own? Yee, that's a that's a tough one because if uh, if a programmer is taking the program that they aired like on KPFT, um, and it includes KPFT IDs and all that, it's I would not allow that at WFMU. Um, because it's just it's a blatant copyright violation and even if they're doing it on their own it could really blow back on the station so that's rough I mean what we what we've done at FMU is when there were programmers who wanted to podcast their own shows because there was so much original material within the show and the best show in WFMU by Tom Sharpling was an example of this um, at the end of every three-hour show he had a volunteer located in Hawaii download the show edit out all the copyrighted music, and then re-upload it, and then we put that out as a podcast. Uh, that's probably a way better way to go. Um, I don't think, I, I think it's probably too risky uh, for stations to be podcasting um, copyrighted music either themselves, or in this case, it's not sort of like by proxy. I mean, that's what the copyright owner would, could claim is that, oh, well, KPFT, you weren't actually doing this, but you were you were encouraging your DJs to do it. So that's, even though there's been no action on podcasting copyrighted music, my opinion is that it's just a matter of time before that starts. So I don't think it's worth, I don't think it's worth the risk to do that. 
Um, another question from KPFT. We're seeking to partner with a local producer with a music podcast and to air that podcast. Uh, okay. Um, see, podcasts don't fall into the whole sound exchange reporting thing. So when, when, when you use the word report, um, KPFT, um, it doesn't, reporting doesn't pertain to podcasting. Reporting only pertains to webcasting. And the only thing that's legal within a webcasting um, license is a two-week streaming archive, not a podcast. Um, yeah, if you're partnering with a local producer for a music podcast, you are going to have to get the clearances on the publishing and the master. Uh, and you may you may also have to get the if the publishing um, has if the publisher has a relationship with Harry Fox, then you might have to pay the Harry Fox agency as well. And one more question. This is from Paul. If a news or public affairs program plays full songs, how much of a risk is there in archiving it for longer than two weeks and they're making it available for download? I think there's a huge risk in making it available for download. Um, the risk of having it up there for longer than two weeks, I think, is just going to vary artist by artist. There's some artists who would get very bent out of shape about that and some artists who wouldn't. Um, stations are also free to try to get uh, waivers to release them from following a lot of the DMCA complementary rules. Um, like here at WFMU, we have many, many, over a thousand waivers um, from bands and record labels that have released us from uh, the what are called the complementary rules of the, of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. All right, um, that's all the time we have for this Google Hangout. It worked better than I expected. Um, thanks a lot to Ruth and to Liz for helping me out today and to Sally from NFCB for giving me the go ahead to do this. And this is going to be archived uh, somewhere and uh, I'll probably uh, send the link along uh, to the NFCB listserv as soon as I have that link available. If anybody has any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me at ken at wfmu.org. Um, thanks again. Have a good day.